Welcome to another edition of 805 Sports Talk. Half of our team is here today <laughs> on this National Signing Day. I mean, lucky for us, we didn't have to pick out any hats or see our parents uh, flip out on what decision we made. <laughs> but, Kenny, it was a jam-packed day on our end. I mean, we had signing days over at San Inez, St. Joseph, Lompoc as well. I was on hand to watch Toa Tawa commit to the University of Nevada. And we I know we touched base on this two weeks ago, but... Kenny, in your mind, I mean, do you think Toa Tawa is making the wise decision for himself? I think he is. He has um, he has real family roots over there. Um, Vita Vitawa is, I believe, on the coaching staff, and you can get, maybe get into it more. There is even more of a family connection. A certain Tawa is transferring from UCLA. Yeah, <laughs> to I just to Nevada. Yeah. Yeah, I just received word um, <coughs> earlier today from my conversation with T. Tawa that Anu Tawa is going to be playing his final year in Reno. So that's three Tawas already on that Wolfpack, uh, on that Wolfpack roster. It's a, it's a stressful day right now. Sometimes I couldn't sleep. Just thinking about where I'll be laying my head for the next three or four years. But I'm glad, glad it's all over with. And, uh, you know, I'm excited today to run with the pack. Talk about that backfield. I mean, you're part of that group, and Devontae Lee, who is also a viral sensation. Talk about that backfield coming into the 2018 class. Um, for what I've seen so far, Devontae, uh, he's, a, he's a great athlete. You guys see his, his uh, highlight tape going viral. You know, you can see the, the type of player he is on the field. He kind of speaks for himself. Um, I'm excited to run with him and, and, and uh, start something and turn the program around up there in Nevada and, uh, and uh, run the rock. Do you almost get a sense that you're kind of going to Nevada to kind of finish what your brother started over there, so to speak? Uh, no, I really feel like I'm just going to be starting my own legacy okay. and everything I got going on. I, I, I didn't go to Nevada because my brother was there or because he went there and what he has done. I'm going to Nevada to start something for myself and, and uh, make a name for myself up there. Coach Jay is a, he's a wonderful coach. Uh, I love the way he coaches, the way he treats his players and his connection between his players. You know, it's, it's something high more off the field and, and the connection and the bond that, they, that the players share with him is, is, is amazing. I love the field. Dude. My last question, I mean, four years as a Lompoc Brave, I mean, when you look back at that, just what words comes to your mind when you think about your times as a Brave? Uh, awesome. I, mean, I couldn't have got the experience like that um, with just a bunch of our community boys that's, that's coming from a small town uh, doing big things, you know. I mean, I, I, I'm very blessed and honored to be able to attend a school like Lompoc. Can you think of an athlete who has so much scrutiny and weight because of his surname and because of the legacy of his brothers? I mean, would you say Toa was like that one athlete who had faced so much scrutiny and never, never seen before? Uh, actually, I knew comes to mind <laughs> another tower mm -hmm. as far as scrutiny. Um, Cameron Walker did receive a fa did receive a fair amount of scrutiny, but Toa probably at least as much as any athlete from around here as as far as scrutiny as to where he was going to go. You know, I can um, I can remember uh, hearing about Toa's name at the youth football level and. He had become this viral sensation. He was labeled Touchdown Toa, and Andrew Jones had mentioned that at the age of 10, people thought right away Toa Tao was going to be somebody special. And, you know, it turned out he was, but, I mean, there was also that added weight of his surname considering the fact that Vi, as you remember, was such a household name in this area, and then Anu after that. But, you know, big credit to Tawa, Toa Tawa, for just the way he handled things in those four years at Lompoc High. And, just also consider this, I mean, he during his time at Lompoc High, the Braves uh, managed to move up each division. They were they were able to place themselves in Division Three in the very end. So, I mean, here's a burning question I should probably ask you, Kenny. You've seen all three Tawa brothers. Is Toa the best one out of the bunch? It, I think he is, I think he is on a par with the other two, I think he's on a par. It's hard to say better because he, for one thing, he, um, Vi Tawa, I think he is on Vi's level as far mm -hmm. as I knew. It's difficult to say because I knew plays a different position. You know, right. I, I knew played dif defensive end and um, Toa made his name as a, as a running back. But 
I would I would say on a par. I think they're all three on about the same level. I would actually. I would, I would probably say Toa had probably the better accolades, but that's just me. I mean, granted, <laughs> Vi was the one who really raised the bar in that household. Then Anu followed suit. Vi did play pro for a time. Yeah. So. In fact, I did see that Seattle Seahawks helmet <laughs> inside the house, yeah. but. One other signing day involving the sport of football, it was at St. Joseph. Our Joe Bailey was on hand at St. Joseph to see the trio of Knights move on to the next level. And Mason Bailey was the third guy in that group to make his commitment. He's heading over to Kansas Wesleyan and in the IA school. And, you know, when the times that I got a chance to see Bailey play, I saw this tall ball hawk on the defensive side of football, also very reliable target at wide receiver. I mean, would you agree that's the, uh, the scouting report on Bealey? I would say so, yep. And um, uh, Tim Miller, he was he was a real hitter at, um, I believe he was a linebacker. Mm -hmm. he, he, and he was, I would constantly hear his name called being in on, on defensive play. So very, cons yeah, very consistent, you know, all three very consistent should have good careers, good solid careers. Definitely, and what we're gonna do here as we normally do, especially Kenny, since he does such a proficient job of keeping track of guys, we're gonna keep an eye on how these guys progress moving forward now. One other commit, this time it's uh, the other football, soccer. Right. Yeah, Julia <laughs> Pritchard earlier this morning at San really? Inez making her commitment, so break this down. Like, what's, what's the news involving Julia Pritchard? Well, she made it official today on National Letter of Intent signing day, but Really, she said she had already made her decision in her sophomore year that she was going to go to Sonoma State. Um, she just figured it was a good fit for her. The soccer team is typically very successful. She said they were very successful in their league. Um, she does have a brother, Jacob, who goes to UC Davis, which is mm -hmm. not terribly far from there. So she will have some family, at least in the region. She said it was a beautiful campus, just like just like the feel. I think I think these um, young men and women know after they visited the campus just what feels right, what's a good fit. I don't think Julia really considered any place else. She she decided she had already decided her sophomore year that she was going to go. She just happened to make it official today. With her, with her signing. And you know, it's funny you mentioned Sonoma State because a few days ago, I had a conversation with Zane Sheckard, a player we've uh, seen plenty of times in this area. She's committed. That is where she's State. going. That's yeah. where she's going. So, yeah. So two, two standouts from this area heading there uh, to a good solid school. Yeah. And the thing about Sonoma State that resonated with me in my conversation with, with Zane is that it kind of gives off that home vibe. I mean, she talked about I think being- that's what Julia thought. Yeah, she, mm -hmm. being surrounded by trees, being surrounded in a small community where everybody knows each other. So those were really those, uh, those elements that really played into their role. And I'm sure it was the same thing with Julia as well. And I think so. I mean, Sonoma State's not, it's not in some concrete jungle. It is small enough. And um, yeah, Julia thought it was a beautiful campus, very, very scenic campus. It's in a pretty scenic part of the state. Yeah, definitely. So moving along, I mean, we all saw what happened on Sunday. And I mean, Philadelphia Eagles for the first time in franchise history winning the Super Bowl. And Kenny, I'll, I'll be real with you. I mean, originally I wasn't sold about watching this game, but to me it was kind of like that, that movie you don't want to see in theaters, but then like you have that, that urge that you want to give it a chance. You go to the theater and then you come away very, very impressed. I mean, What's your breakdown of Super Bowl 52? I thought it was just wild. There was a total of one punt. New England never punted and they lost. But I think there were a few very specific plays um, that the Eagles made that they deserve to win. They'll be talking about this for years, that stroke of genius, that running a reverse pass that false caught yeah. for the touchdown. Um, we, the Philadelphia got to Brady one time, and that one time happened to be the strip sack in which in which they recovered the fumble. Uh, Doug Peterson was aggressive the whole time, which I think you have to be against New England because especially with Brady, settling th with for field goals was not going to cut it. He knew that they were down 33-32 and. I thought they had to go for it in fourth down in that situation, and they did, and they got just enough 
And which brings us, I think, to those two uh, much discussed. Was it, did the receiver <laughs> complete the process? The first one, the first one I agreed with, but I thought was debatable. But I mean, the Ertz touchdown, I thought that was just, that was a no brainer. He was a runner. He took two or three mm -hmm. solid strides. After he caught the ball, he had the ball firmly in his grasp. I mean, he, he happened to lose grasp of it briefly after he touched the ground, after he already broke the plane, and then he got it back. To me, there was no doubt. And the part that blew my mind about those catches was hearing Chris Collinsworth's breakdown of it. I mean, I'm here thinking, Chris, you played wide receiver in the NFL. You should know what a catch is. I know. I mean, he's... I've, I know there are some people who don't think he's a good commentator, but I do. I always, I've always liked Collinsworth. I thought, I think he's a good analyst, and to me, he seems just like a good guy. Period. But I can see his doubts on the first one, but the second one, yeah, I do, I think he was ambivalent on the second one. But um, he, the, uh, as the official explained, the receiver turned into a runner in that situation. It's not as if he took one small step and then was hit and the ball came loose and he lost control. But you know, I wish they would just scrub that rule from the books. I don't yeah. know why they ever put it in, that completing the process. Yeah. It, it puts the referees in an awkward situation because often it's so hard to tell. I mean, to me, they make the catch, they have possession for more than a split second, it's a catch. But you know what, um, the aftermath of this game, I mean, there's just so many like great stories, I mean, on Doug Peterson's end, he was a high school coach for nearly 10 years, and he goes from high school coach to the NFL. And I tend to wonder, was there that one parent who thought he was an idiot and thought... I know. Yeah. <laughs> we thought, yeah, right. I wonder what that parent's thinking Yeah, And now, now this yeah. parent's probably like, you know, he produced my son. But <laughs> Nick Foles, though, I mean, I can't help but tip my hat to the journey of Nick Foles. I mean, there was that period where he really thought about just ending his NFL career, just moving on with his life. But... You know, it's a life lesson. Like, no matter, like, what hardships you go through, sometimes all you need is one more chance. And was that the vibe you got with yeah, the it's, yeah, right. It's a wonderful story. And I thought he, what he said was very instructive for young people. He said, look, I wouldn't be here if I hadn't failed a million times. He said, when you, when you fail, that's how you learn. Absolutely. And I also want to add, and I mentioned this uh, about two, three weeks ago on the show, Michael Kendricks from Fresno, I mean, I didn't get a chance to uh, see his high school career, but I'm familiar with his high school football coach, Pat Plummer, who's a legend up in that area. So seeing Michael Kendricks win a Super Bowl and being the first guy from Hoover High to actually play on that stage, I thought that was really cool. I know, that's a great story for the Fresno area. I'm, I'm sure the B will be all over that one. Yeah, they area. were. And, you know, it's funny because normally you see Edison High, which produced Icky Woods. Um, you would see even a Columbus yeah, West like or a school. Yeah, he had a good school. career with the yeah. Cincinnati Bengals. Yeah. yeah, normally like you hear those schools producing the NFL talent. Well, now Hoover High has that claim to fame that they, they produced a Super Bowl 52 champion now. Also part of the Super Bowl were the commercials in. I don't know about you, Kenny. I was very disappointed with Bud Light's Dilly Dilly. I mean, what, what's your take? Yeah, for all that buildup, it, it, I, was, I was disappointed in the conclusion. I mean, some robot makes a convenience store run beer run. yeah all that fighting and uh, it's all for a liquor store run although i thought alexa's commercial was very clever that, that yeah I, yes i thought that was a good one i i think actually they the trends seem to have been reverse of the i mean for many years the the games were duds the commercials were well super mm -hmm. now the trend seems to have been reversed the games are fantastic and the commercials fall flat and you know, I would try to I try to prevent myself from going on YouTube or watching like World's Greatest Super Bowl commercials because I didn't want to jinx myself. And you know, I gave it I give the commercials a chance, and I'll say overall I give it a C. The commercials? Oh, mm -hmm. I would have given right. I would maybe I think even me a little worse C minus. They're just flat. Nothing mm -hmm. special about any of them. Really. But you know what? That Super Bowl wasn't flat at all. Oh yeah, I mean, that was, was that was up with the yeah. That was one for the ages. That'll be I'll that'll come be one of the ep epics and i'll come clean you and joe picked the eagles i was the only one who picked <laughs> the patriots i literally almost came in here wearing a german shepherd mask <laughs> as punishment but hey that's all we have for 805 sports talk joe bailey should be back with us next week hopefully we'll also have elliot stern so keep it locked here especially as we start previewing the playoff chases in soccer and basketball